so let me first introduce Mark, Alan, Leslie, and Mark's kind enough to maybe one, just one, yeah, that, that's better. Um, come down all the way from Monmouth, Maine, wow, and I don't know where that is, but I think it's pretty far up, and we're so happy to have you here. Mark is a winner of six National Magazine Writing Awards. He has written 11 books, including three historical novels that he has here today, and we'll talk to you about those after, um, and two modern-day mystery thrillers. His latest novel, Crossing, is about the KKK in Maine, and he draws his information from towns like Hittery, Wells, Sanford, Hollis, Kennebunk, Saco, where the KKK drew large followings in the mid-1920s. I can't um, tell you more than Mark can, and I'd love to get us started. So please welcome Mark Ellen Leslie. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you for coming, everybody. You know, Ku Klux Klan in Maine, Ku Klux Klan in Maine in the 1920s, this is lily white Maine, right? <coughs> And where 60 years before, a lot of us Mainers, uh, our ancestors, fought for the North against the South to, to uh, free the slaves. 60 years later, yes, there's a Ku Klux Klan in Maine. This is the Maine that uh, I, I've, I've spoken to other groups about this, and I've only had one person tell me they've been taught that the Ku Klux Klan was here in Maine in the 1920s. Has anyone here ever been taught that? Hey, we got two, three. There we go. There's, that's, I mean, it, it's, it's so rare that we have three people out of hundreds that I've spoken to about this. But no, it was uh, 1920s. We only had a, a handful of black people in the state of Maine, but the Ku Klux Klan decided that they wanted to go nationwide. They had, they had faded out of, of favor across the country, and they decided Maine uh, was the place to go. It says, if Maine goes, so goes the country. It was a real a real idea back then, and it was, it was the truth, and if they could make the Klan grow here in Maine, then they could go anywhere. They could go anywhere across the north. And so they had to invent another boogeyman. There were no uh, black people to speak of. So their, their demons were other people. Their demons were not just the Jews, and not just the blacks, but their demon were French Canadians. They were French Canadians had flooded into Biddeford Saco, right? Into Westbrook, into Lewiston, up in Waterville. They had, the French Canadians were, were cutting down the trees of Maine and, and running them down the rivers. Those are the French Canadians. And they were taking the jobs, they, the Ku Klux Klan said, of native Mainers. Not just native Mainers, Native Americans. And so, indeed, the Ku Klux Klan, born in the South in the 1860s, came back here to Maine. And this is what my book is about, but uh, I want to tell you about more about it. There were, in, go ahead, that slide there, Sharon. My right hand lady. There were the good guys. Governor Percival Baxter, Bates College President Clifton Gray, Bowdoin College President Kenneth Sills. These are all outspoken opponents to the Klan, but they were bad guys. Hit that button. Saco Mayor John Smith was an avowed KKK member. Close to home, Saco. Westbrook, Mayor Charles Tuttle Jr., KKK member. Hit that button. Auburn Mayor, close to where I am, Fred Walton, KKK member. Bath Mayor, Alan Irish, KKK member. Hit that button. And then there were some, you know, we're still not really sure about some people think they're pretty sure, but we have a pretty good idea. Ralph Owen Brewster never claimed that he was a member of the Klan, but the Klan supported him in all of his, his political career, and he never spoke out against them. So was he? Was he not? It's a topic for debate. How do you feel about this issue, Sharon? I'm not the speaker. <laughs> Okay, hit that button again. There was a, it was a nationwide phenomenon. The, and the conflagration did engulf Maine. Look at the figures here. In 1925, 
five. Can everybody see the figure? How many? These were from the Washington Post. Now, we may not believe the Washington Post today. I think it was more believable back then. But that's the, these are the figures that they had. 150,141 people in Maine. If they weren't members, they were at least supportive of the Ku Klux Klan in Maine. We only had 700 and, well, I get up here, 792 mem uh, people in the state of Maine at that time. 150,000 of them were Klan supporters. How many Catholics were there? Anybody want to venture a guess? It's like 153,000. So there are nearly as many Klan supporters as there were Catholics in May in 1925. 19%. One out of five. One out of five. The Belfast Republican, as a matter of fact, the, the Belfast Republican Journal at that time reported that in the mid-1920s, Klan chapters sprouted up across Maine as rapidly as potato vines in the dark, which is pretty fast, I understand. Um, hit that button, Sharon. This Maine Klan, uh, this is in the Maine Historical Society collection. This is the Klan uh, regalia for the state of Maine. Now down in the south, in North Carolina, the Klan not only made money by membership fees, they also made merchandise like these robes and the hoods, Klan swords, they had Klan Bibles, there were Klan helmets. Anybody for candy? KKK candy? I don't know if they spell it with a K, probably did, right? KKK candy, and they even had dry cleaning and life insurance. They sold dry cleaning life insurance services. So overall, it's estimated that the Klan conservatively generated annual revenues of $25 million. And sound like much today, maybe $25 million. Back then, that was worth $300 million in today's, today's money. $300 million annually. And at its peak, the Klan had 1.5 to 4 million members, somewhere in that broad vicinity. And here is Maine's Klan patch. So if you got the hat, you got the coat, you got the patch, you are good to go, right? All you needed was a horse. Okay. <laughs> Who lit the fire? Well, the Klan sent to Maine one of its most charismatic, because they wanted to win Maine, right? So they went, sent one of its most charismatic recruiters, the King Klegel of Maine, eventually, Eugene Farnsworth. Now, he's not related to the Farnsworth of Rockland, okay? He was from Massachusetts, so we can, you know, they can claim him. But he was a magician, a, <laughs> he was a magician, truly, in a previous life. And he reconstituted himself as the front man in the state of Maine for the Ku Klux Klan. And the party line that he got was lectures. Now, back then, there was no radio, TV. There wasn't uh, movies to go to that we have today. So people went to lectures. Mr. Farnsworth was a charismatic, dynamic speaker on Americanism. What is it to be an American? Sound like today, maybe, to somebody? I, well, what was it to be an American? And it was the carrot that drew people to his, to his um, not only to his speeches, but to the organization, organization, to the Ku Klux Klan. So he was energetic, he was magnetic, he was engaging, and in January 1923, he spoke in Portland and then toured what they said. He toured every hamlet, probably Berwick and North Berwick, because you do have a history here of that and every city across the entire state of Maine. I don't think he ever slept. A lot of train rides there. But everywhere he went, he got admirers. He was a great for quotes, terrific for the quotes. And that meant free publicity. Free publicity in the newspapers across the state of Maine. Even front page coverage. The Lewis and Son would carry, and other papers too, would carry on the front page his entire talk. His entire talk. And I have a quote from my old newspaper where you worked at one point in time. Lewiston Sun declared, the Klan should get, quote unquote, fair treatment, honest discussion, and a sensible publicity. Well, that must have sat well with the city's large Franco-American population that we were talking about earlier. 
So, okay. Can everybody see this all right? This is a map of Maine, and it's where the more tangible, the, more, the larger clan claverins, that's local clubs, were in existence at that time. We have Kittery, Wells, Kennebunkport, Sanford, Hollis, Saco. Any of these, anybody live in these towns? <coughs> uh, Bath, Auburn, Lewiston. And, you know, there's such a population of, of French Canadians in Auburn, Lewiston. You say, how, how did this work? But there was, you don't hear a lot of battles going on. And, and in Maine, it was, not a, it was not a violent, you hear about lynchings and tars and featherings and all of that in, in, the, in the South. Up here, there wasn't so violent, although, you, are you familiar with John Baptist High School in Bangor? Are you familiar with who John Baptist was? John Baptist was a priest who the Klan tarred and feathered in Brunswick. And when they created John Baptist High School, naming it after him was, uh, was to point the fin to finger in the eye of the Ku Klux Klan in Maine. Truth be told. And it was all the way up into my favorite part of Maine there, Fort Fairfield. And where I was born, Eastport, hey. But I had nothing, nothing to do with it. The Leslies had nothing to do with this. I have no, no, nothing on the record of any Leslies belonging to the Klan. So, <coughs> there we go. Um, so, okay, we, we be, go on to the next slide, please, Sharon. Getting to the crux of the matter here is what was the accelerant? What drove people to the Klan? What drove people to join the Klan and, and get behind it so strongly? Well, to rid the country of foreigners' influence on culture and politics. The new Klan, based on debate over Americanism, what it meant to be an American and who deserved to be here. And thus, their, this, their, this was their agenda. Stop the whiskey running. Oppose subversion, and we'll get into more of this later, because I want to tell you what, they were, what the stories were about the, uh, that the Klan was uh, spreading. Uh, promote public schools. And that has to do with the Catholic schools, and I'll get into that a little bit. To promote respect for the law, to protect, protect American jobs, and we go on. Oppose public funding for Catholic schools. Back in the 20s, we publicly funded Catholic schools. The Ku Klux Klan did not like that idea because they said that the, the Pope did not want King James Version Bibles in the schools. Now, of course, we have no Bibles in the schools. That says something. To operate as a social network. I'll get into this later because it wasn't just these big clan meetings. They had cookouts. They had barbecues. They had a good time. They had parties. They had Fourth of July celebrations. And they opposed the Catholics' allegiance to the Pope. So, <clears throat> this, how effective, how... Uh, how effective was the Klan in, in Maine? This is a, a picture of a daytime parade in Milo, Maine that was not only the first one in Maine, it was the first daylight Ku Klux Klan parade in the entire country. The first daylight parade. This is in Milo. This is in Milo in 1920, September or something, 1923. And here's another picture of, of that same, uh, same parade. Some people said, hey, I know him by his shoes. That's Charlie. I can tell by his boots. But anyhow, it was in the daylight. So there are parades, parades, and more parades for every time of the year. There are Independence Day parades, Columbus Day parades, and there are parades from Kittery to Portland, from Brewer to East Hodgton, all the way up in the county. There were parades. My old town of Brewer had parades by the Klan. And I find that hard to believe, but it is true. Um, so let's go on to the next, the next slide. Getting back to what ca caught fire, there was economic distress in the 1920s. 
a lot of the, the country was re coming back, they were getting strength, they were getting stronger economically from the war, but Maine was not one of them. And so people were, wor were worried about their, their finances in the first place. And then they worried over the Catholic organization and the stre strength and the Protestant weakness. Indeed, the Klan said that Catholics held a stronger allegiance to the Pope, who was halfway across the world, than they did to America. The Klan said that every time a child was born to a Catholic family, the father would give a weapon to the local church, to the local church's arsenal. The Klan said that the Catholic Church had bought a cannon at Georgetown, Georgetown University, up on the hill, even to Georgetown. That cannon could reach the, a White House. Why did they do that? So, besides all the existential targets like the Pope, halfway across the world, the Jesuits, the Knights of Columbus, they specifically attacked the presence of Catholics and Jews on public school boards. As those Catholic population was increasingly objecting to the reading of the King James Bible in the state-supported classrooms. A rural to urban shift had taken place, which caused social unrest. The loss of political and economic prominence by the white clan members. And thus they promised to clean up politics. More about that in a minute. But as Farnsworth, Eugene Farnsworth was famous for saying, the cheapest thing to buy in New England is a politician. Some people might say that today. I don't. Economic and social disillusionment. The Klan was fearful that foreign culture, religion, and politics would contaminate, that was the word contaminate, the Anglo-American country. And finally, on this list, general uneasiness that stemmed from all of these. Now, the first naturalization, that's bringing a member, a person into the Klan, the first naturalization in Maine took place in September of 1922 in Bangor. The first state convention, anybody here from Waterville? Okay, all you Waterville people ought to know that the state convention of, Cl uh, of the Klan, the first one was held in the forest right outside the city. 15,000 people came to that convention out in the woods outside of Waterville. 15,000 people showed up. In September 23, there were 4,000 Klansmen in Portland. Bangor, Lewis, and Auburn each had 1,000 members. Waterville, 650. Brewer and Augusta, 300 members in each of those claverns. Old Orchard, how far is Old Orchard from here? 150 members in Old Orchard. Randolph and South Gardner, each of them had 150. And in June 1924, when 300 were initiated in the Gardner chapter, 3,000 people looked on. So how powerful was the Klan? Listen to the story. In March of 1925, the South Portland Mayor William McDonald had almost all of the city council members attend a KKK meeting. This is in their council chambers. But in September, the Portland Mayor refused this. So that brought, uh, that, the Portland Mayor was Carol Chaplin. And he would not allow them in and he would not allow a parade quote-unquote, in the interest of the public peace. So two months later, two months later, 6,000 people took part in Klan rallies in Portland. 6,000 people right around Portland City Hall. They led to a restructuring of Portland's government. In the restructuring of Portland's government, the mayor, you know how they just voted the mayor in? He's been gone since 1923. There's been no, no mayor, and that's how they got retribution to the mayor of Portland. They changed the how, the how the government was set up in the city of Portland. Mayor's out. Mayor Strimley had to wait for 80 years, 95 years, gee, 95 years, before there was this, uh, they had the change in Portland. The result, he was out, and there you go. You saw the power of the Klan just in Portland. And here we have a picture um, of the Rollins estate on Forest Avenue in Portland. The Klan bought this for $75,000, 1923 money, and built an enormous hall. 
It included a 4,000 seat auditorium, 4,000 seat auditorium. How many people in the Cumberland County can fit in the Cumberland County Civic Center? 4,000 people, and it had a dining hall that seated 1,600, 1,600 people in their dining hall. Now, listen to this one. This is just one month in 1923. Just think of this. Okay, start on August the 18th. 1,500 Klansmen witnessed the invitation of, invitation of 400 new members. Outside, along the street, where they marched, 10,000 people lined Forest Avenue in Portland to watch the celebration. September 8th, that's two weeks later, 800 Klansmen saw 200 people naturalized. September 7th, six days later, Farnsworth spoke to 1,000 women, were they all men? No. 1,000 women, prospective members of the proposed Women's Auxiliary, which had 500 women pledged to join immediately. Reports vary on its success, but some say that chapters sprouted out of this Women's Auxiliary throughout the state of Maine, including Kittery. Am I pointing in the right direction? Including Kittery. <laughs> including Kittery, thank you. So the ladies auxiliary, nicknamed the Klaxima, okay, again with a K, we've got to keep the K going here. Those typewriters must have run out. Uh, 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 the Klaxima gave parties, bazaars, picnics, Christmas socials, bean suppers, all of this to give the clan a family image, right? It's all family. Hmm. Yeah, even the clergy, even some clergy joined the clan. There was a full-time clergy member up in Bangor for the clan. Two, two of them, two full-time. They had to actually fought over the job, but there were two clergy members for the, for the Bangor chapel of the clan. Here in the Berwick area, if I move on, oh, yeah, keep that slide right there, Sharon. Here in the, Bang in the Berwick area, there was a summer campground in Wells. In September 1923, there were 150 Klansmen in Old Orchard Beach and 4,000 in Portland. And when Brewster, Governor Brewster, with Klan ba backing, was re-elected in 1926, he carried, are you ready for this? It's 1926. Klan supported, Governor Brewster got re-elected. Where did he lose? He won every single county in the state of Maine with the exception of Androscoggin and Kennebec counties. What does that mean? He carried York, Cumberland, and Oxford counties to win his reelection. Brewster won all the cities of Maine except Biddeford, Augusta, Lewiston, Old Town, and Waterville. Every other city in the state of Maine, Brewster won. In 1928, the New York Times referred to Kennebunkport and Newport. I know one person from Newport. Anybody here from Kennebunkport? Okay, you can rest easy. But the New York Times called them old Ku Klux capitals. So local chapters of the Klan lingered on in some main towns years after the national and state organizations had dissolved, partly kept alive by their women's auxiliaries. In 1931, in Kittery, the ladies of the Klan held a baked bean and salad supper at the local Grange Hall. Ladies, are we getting a picture here? You know, you think of the Klan as guys in those parades. There were gals behind this. So, uh, the, the Kittery Clavern sponsored a booth. This is in a depression era. The Kittery uh, Clavern sponsored a booth and there were gardens, ladies' gardens clubs, church groups, all of this, unemployment bazaar, they called it. And the Lions Club was there, and they were just another booth in this, in this, uh, celebrate this event. The names of six booth tenders were published in the newspaper, suggesting that the quote-unquote invisible empire, the Klan, the invisible empire, was trying to adapt to the role of local fraternity organization. And they did that pretty well for a while. But remember the first slides of Crash and Burn? It burned pretty quickly. Uh, but, 1988, K 
KKK materials are left right here in Kennebunk, 1988. Remember this? <laughs> and last winter, Freeport, KKK materials left on cars are on Freeport. Do people remember this? It was in the, it was in the news. Um, flash forward. Now this is the KKK hierarchy. So we, I'll go through this quickly. I think I'll just jump through the whole thing. We were the realm of Maine. Maine was the realm of Maine. We had the King Klegel. You had um, the exalted Cyclops. That was the president of the clan. He was a doctor in, uh, in, in Portland at the time. Why did it flame out? Well, to put his downfall to a great degree on the shoulders uh, was of the instigator himself is the way we explain most of this. Eugene Farnsworth, and I'll get to why later, but the women's KKK of Maine. <laughs> now the National Klan opposed this women's Klan because they didn't get any money from it. The dues that were paid to, to, the, to Farnsworth, directly to Farnsworth, never got to the National Klan, so they, they were against that. And Farnsworth resigned in April 24. So many of the Klaners who were loyal to him left the Klan. Think of your local, local group. The president might get in trouble, step down. A lot of people leave with them. Sadly, it happens to churches a lot. Um, so a lot of these people left the Klan, but the, there are other reasons. The press, who always loved Farnsworth, who doesn't love a great quote? Who doesn't love a great quote, uh, whether it be cable television or who? And Farnsworth was gone. Ah, oh, darn. When who did they bring in? Some guy named E.W. Gayer? And where was he from? Indiana? <sighs> You can hear the big exhale of clanners all across Maine. Some guy from Indiana. So it's involvement of politics, which they said they're going to stay out of. Remember, they're going to stay out of politics. That got them in trouble because they, stay, they were so involved deeply in politics. And uh, so there was internal strife and there were scandals. Let me tell you about the, the scandals. This is kind of fun. So listen up. Take notes. Much of the clan funds, okay, it was 10 buck dues, right? $10 dues. $5.50 out of the $10 dues allegedly had gone directly into the private hands of the leaders of the Klan. Meanwhile, the Klan, this meant there was economically troubles within the Klan Claverns themselves because the leaders were taking all the money. William Simmons, the founder of the Klan, received a salary of $12,000. $12,000, unheard of. That was an unlimited expense account in addition to that. He had a house. He had two cars. This is 1925, 26. He had two cars. This is not 2018. It was two, back, two cars. Who needs two cars back then? But anyhow, that, and $25,000 in cash. Okay. The average income in the United States at that time was $1,537. This guy was raking in $12,000. Edward Clark, one of the chief promoters, received as much as $40,000 a month from October 21, 1921 to March 1923. 40 grand a month, everybody else making $1,500 a year, okay. D.C. Stevenson, the grand, is this kind of piling on now? You've got the little avalanche of why the Klan got in trouble? Okay, D.C. Stevenson, the grand dragon of Indiana, emerged from his Klan affiliation with three million bucks in his pocket. Three million bucks. Immorally, immorality was exposed. The Klan opposed liquor, right? Liquor was a big thing, regularly. Not, not good, not, not, not good. But it was discovered this Simmons guy, who was the founder of the Klan, had become more and more fond of a daily libation and ended up as a drunkard, <laughs> a public drunkard. Oh, yoy. And if that wasn't so bad, I mean, we're talking about morality is important here for us Americans. Morality is important. And the two leaders, public relation-wise, Clark and Mrs. T Tyler, uh, down in North Carolina, were arrested drunk, disorderly, and, a <clears throat> and in a 
Okay, yes, compromising position. That made the papers, that was not good. That was not a good publicity stunt for the two of them. And then in March, okay, that, we're going to go, we're, we're, we're ratcheting up here, okay, we're ratcheting it up. D.C. Stevenson, in March 1925, was indicted on charges of assault and battery, rape, mayhem, and kidnapping. Guess worse. Rape, mayhem, and kidnapping, and oh yeah, murder was later added when the young victim died. Crash and burn. Crash and burn. Yeah. And so what did they do on top of all of this? It was a brilliant move. They moved uh, the headquarters for the state of Maine to Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Now that really won a lot of hearts. So, <laughs> yes, right. They had political disaster. Brewster had called for the Rep Republican solidarity, right, in 1924. He called for Republican solidarity in 1924. In 1925, he backed the Democratic candidate. Why? Because, no, did I say it in here? Oh, I gave it away. Darn. <laughs> the Republican's wife was a Catholic. Can't vote for him. <sighs> okay. I, I don't know if I can go more, on more of this. Um, okay, so in 1928, Brewster lost a senatorial nomination, and what did he do? He offered Baxter 20,000 Klan votes if Baxter would run for governor and support Brewster for the Senate. Did I get you confused? If you support me, I'll give the, get to have the Klan vote for you for governor. Okay, but that... <laughs> governor Baxter has a high moral ground. He had a high moral ground. If anybody knows anything about the governor, and he let it be known that he... He was, the Brewster was trying to buy him off. Okay. And then uh, the Klan Auditorium of Frost Avenue burned. We don't know how, but it burned and it was never rebuilt. Matter of fact, that whole Rollins estate is gone. If you go there now, it's non existent. And I think I've run, run you through, through a lot of this, but I, I, I wanted to see. Are you familiar? Are you. Uh, you want to hear some of my, my speech? Okay. Before I give it, I want to, I want to say this. No, I'll, I'll, I'll give the speech for us. Picture me as Eugene Farnsworth. Handsome guy, white, flowing hair, goatee, well-dressed. Picture me as charismatic. Okay. Friends and neighbors, with a little explanation you've received, your coming here illustrates the need for this meeting and the need for the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Thank you for coming. The Ku Klux Klan is the world's greatest secret, social, patriotic, fraternal, and beneficiary organization. It's been just four years since the end of World War I, and we are beset by more sickness in our society. America faces greater, more significant, more devastating challenges than ever before. The future of America, the white race, of morality, of our position in the eyes of God lies of the success of the Ku Klux Klan. And yet, just the other day, Governor Percival Baxter dismissed the validity of our fellowship, saying that level-headed people should not consider the Klan. They should dismiss us out of hand. Well, I say to Percy, dear man, remove your flimflamery from the public discussion. Open your eyes, man, and you will see the truths of the Klan's concern displayed every single day. Rotten politics, aliens in our country, liquor in the speakeasies, threats against our Bible, face facts, governor, because the rest of us common folk must live in these, with these facts every single hour of every single day. Politics? The cheapest thing that you can buy in New England today is a politician. But the Klan, we can't be bought. What can be bought? Illegal booze. I could take you right up to Bangor today and show you where the speakeasies are. Bangor City Hall. I'll speak the names of those people who run those speakeasies. Aliens, foreigners, what harm they? I can show you the tombstones of murderers of our presidents. And those tombstones are not Protestant cemeteries. Wake up, Mr. Baxter. This is so-called infamous Ku Klux Klan is going to elect the next governor of the state of Maine. 
And we're not going to stop there either. You shall see Percy replaced by a true man of honor, of grit, of substance. Ralph Owen Brewster. Friends, we call this public meeting for the white Gentile Protestant people of Berwick, Maine. That's where I am, right? Berwick. <laughs> You're no doubt aware that the Klan is active all around here. We even have a summer camp for the kids to go play over here in Kittery, over in Wells. Every day, 3,000, every day, 3,500 men are joining the Klan across America. Why? Well, let me take the gloves off. I haven't taken them off yet. I'm going to take them off now. Thousands across this beautiful state are joining us because they now realize we must join together if we want to preserve the state's beauty and keep it in our hands rather than have it fall into the hands of aliens. Aliens, Larry. Aliens who serve another god and pray allegiance, not to America, but to a man on the other side of the world. Aliens who never risked their lives for, for the livelihood of this country, never dropped a drop of blood for its defense. Aliens who have come here uninvited, unwanted by the greater majority of Americans. The very reason we exist today is because we are threatened by outside forces, outside movements that will twist our lives if we don't take action. And I can't go on, I'm sorry. But you see some of the reasoning, some of the stories, some of the tales that were told. We had the, the Catholic people buying a cannon on top of the hill of Georgetown University to shoot at, at, the, at the Capitol. And uh, I, I've got to take this. This is a... Um, uh, go to the next, next slide, will you? Keep going. Keep going. Yep, keep going. Okay, here's the $64,000 question. Can anybody remember that TV show, the $64,000 question? Nods, heads are nodding, Loy. Heads are nodding. They remember the show. <laughs> are the conditions ripe? Again. Someone was mentioning that there are the Klan is coming back in some areas. In 1987, uh, hit the next slide, Sharon, please. This was a rally in 1987. Imperial wizard James Ferrans of a group of clanners were wearing traditional robes, formed a circle, burning a cross in Rumford, Maine, Milltown, Rumford, Maine. Governor John McKernan called the clan's very existence a quote unquote moral outrage. KKK materials were left in mailboxes in 1987 in Gray and in Falmouth. In 1988, they were left on cars in Kennebunk. In Woodford's Corner Congregational Church up in Portland in 1990. In Appleton, you know where Appleton is? It's halfway between Augusta and Rockland. A little tiny town, Appleton, Maine. In November of 2016. And last January in Augusta and in Freeport. KKK materials were left in people's houses. A small Klan rally was dispersed near Maine, the near Maine Mall in June 1988. And just last winter, we had more materials left in Freeport. So a journalist friend of mine in Rockland, where there was a really strong Klan, as a matter of fact, we were talking about when the governor and the, the, senate, the mayors were, were, in the 1920s, the president of the Maine Senate was from Belfast. He was the first member of the Belfast clan and an outspoken clan member, and he was the president of the Maine Senate. Buzzell was his name. So Andy was doing some research in, in Rockland, and he said this, just as uh, Andy O'Brien from the Rockland Free Press said, just as Klansmen feared that alien hordes of immigrants would eventually establish a Catholic state ruled from the Vatican, many Americans believe the specter of Islamic Sharia law in the U.S. is a real threat today. During the period when the Klan emerged, a series of bombings by Italian anarchists targeting public officials and businessmen created mass hysteria. And now it's international Islamic extremists and homegrown mass shooters carrying out even more ruthless and indiscriminate attacks. Once it was the Irish, the Italian, the bootleggers, the loggers coming down from <laughs> France. Now it's Mexican cartels and inner city drug dealers poisoning our people. So I'll ask again, 
What's the, well, is the country ripe for this to happen? The immigrants of the 1920s, we know, were all legal. A number of them today are not. That stirs the pot. But if we look into our inner beings, into our inner selves, into our, our belief systems, where do, we, where do we think we stand? Where does Maine stand today? Where does Maine stand in our hearts when it comes to illegal aliens, legal aliens? Are we right for this sort of thing to happen again? Now, I've written a book over here called The Crossing, and uh, I hope you take a look at it. It's based on, on the facts of the state of Maine. But it's uh, set up here in northwestern Maine in a fictional town called the, uh, Cooper's Crossing. And you see the conflict that happens in a town where you have people that are really close. People in Brook, I'm sure, are very close with one another. And if you have this charismatic person come in and, and, and that can draw crowds of people and, and has a, a compelling story to tell, is it true? It, is not tr it has a compelling tr story to tell. And you see the conflict that happens in, in that town, and even in the, the religion of that town. Now, uh, I don't want to tell you the ending of my, of my book, but uh, God says to love one another, right? God says to look at the good of people. Are we prepared in the worst of times, in the darkest of times, and when things really bad, bad happen, to look in the good side of people? Are we, are our churches, are our Christian organizations, are we strong and prepared to face that kind of question? Anybody have any questions or any statements you want to make on this? Yes. How much did the Ku Klux Klan have to do with immigration laws? In 1924, there was an immigration law that was passed that had to do with refusing immigration to most of anyone that wasn't white. And as a result of that, in 1939, the St. Louis sailed from Germany with over 900 Jewish people. It's true. That we're not allowed into our country because That's true. of those immigration. That's true. We sent them right back to Europe to be uh, returned to the camps. Here we are back facing immigration laws again. So your question is, how, did the, how much influence did the Klan have? Well, you look at the South. We had, uh, you know, the, uh, the Southern leaders, a lot of the, the uh, in the Senate and the House and of the, the Congress were Klan members. The fear that they instigated the people is probably what they need. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we lived in the Deep South <clears throat> in the late 1960s, and we had a Massachusetts plate. Yeah, I was in the military, but the Klan presence was strong, and it was just a shock <clears throat> to someone who really didn't know anything. In the Northeast. And so it wasn't that long ago. Last year I gave a talk in Rockland, outside of Rockland, and uh, the uh, lady spoke to me. She said her husband worked at the, it was an was a, a African American, and worked at the Maine State Prison. And he said the Klan had a presence in the Maine State Prison. It was a strong presence. And that their children, and she, she was a, a white lady, um, we're facing quite a lot of um, problems in their school because of their, their mixed color. This is, you know, 2017 in Maine. If you turn on your radio tomorrow, 98.1 WTSN, and you listen, you'll hear speeches just like you gave. 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Howie Carr. 
Yes. We're ripe for that yet. Mark, did the women, when they had their events, did they wear the full regalia too? You know, that's something that well, I that I have not read about. You can go and find and do all the research in the world and find very little about the clan in Maine. And that's why no one was taught this, maybe, because no one wanted to know the real truth. I mean, how long did Germany deny that there was the Holocaust? Uh, so that's one of the facts I, I w wasn't able to ascertain, whether they did or not. But, you know, I, I, I'm trying to picture the ladies uh, at the barbecue with the clan regalia, you know, flipping the burgers. I, I have a hard time with that. Maybe, but that's a good question, Sharon. <laughs> Yes, hi. I'm from Kittery, and in the museum down there, we have pictures of a clan march. It's either 20, 1924 or 25. Yeah. And you look, and it's all ladies' shoes under the... Under really? The That's oh, fascinating. Yeah. Women's shoes and Kittery. No. no. Yeah? No. <laughs> that is fascinating. Uh -huh. Does it say the year? 1925, maybe? There were, there were two meetings held in Kittery that we know of, 1924 and 1925. Yeah. And we're not sure which of those it was. Right. But, uh, right. yeah, and there were, you could probably see an easy hundred women anyway, and then there were more. Yeah. And they had a children's clan, too. It's like the, the brown shirts of the, the Nazis. You know, they had a children's group, too. I mean, it was, it's very legitimate. It's very social. We're going to have a picnic. Come on down. We're going to throw. Oh, and they, you know how we have the, uh, at the, <laughs> throw the ball at the, and, and knock the, the firefighter down to give money, you know. Yeah. They had a ball, you throw the ball and knock the Pope down. <coughs> yeah. Sure, it raised lots of dough. <laughs> what was the uh, number one reason that Farnsworth resigned from the Klein? He was forced out basically by the national leadership because he was taking, uh, he was skimming off the top. They didn't like that. Yeah. But I, and he was the face of the Klan in Maine. They shot themselves in the foot. Well, yeah, that's, that's yeah, he was drawing. He was drawing the crowds right up until uh, they kicked him out. And uh, he he saw the opening with the women, Kittery women. <laughs> he saw the opening with the, with the women and said, "Hey, I can bring in some extra dough." And I I don't know how much he left with, but you see, well, that, people were making a lot of money off, off this and uh, they were selling the life insurance and do you have your KKK life insurance anybody in here still I mean you know 80 years later you could have had it you could take your lot dry cleaning down to the KKK laundry I mean they'll get it cleaner and whiter than anybody else they deal with white right yes no and it's interesting you know too a lot of us who have families going back over the generations, we had family who fought in that, in that war. And what, what, was, what, what was the Missouri Compromise? We were, part of the, we were half of the Missouri Compromise. The, the uh, northern states and southern states, or uh, the southern states wanted to keep uh, the same number, at least, of slavery-possessing uh, states as the North had non-slavery states. So when they were going, Missouri was going for uh, its approval as a, as a state. Maine was part of Massachusetts in 19, it was 1820, um, right? 1820. Uh, we, they had to say, okay, we're going to make Maine a non-slavery state, so we'll have as many non-slavery as South So we had that, that history of partition between the North and the South right here in the state of Maine going back a hundred years before 1920 ever came. Mark, can you talk about your background um, before you started writing books and maybe what got you interested in this topic in particular? Okay, yeah. Uh, well, I, I was a newspaper person for... Okay, I got out of the university. Man, so 30 years I was a newspaper person editor mostly uh, at the Lewis and Son, the Portland paper, all the Portland papers. Um, and then got a job to start a golf industry magazine. That was in 1987. Uh, we began this magazine out of nothing, out of thin air, and it became the number two magazine in the golf industry, Golf Course News. It's now golf, called Golf Industry. Left there in the year 2000 to do public relations in the golf industry. 
and that's when I found spare time because there was a lot of work for, it for a while doing PR. So, uh, and, but back when I was at the Lewis and Son, the, that Rumford event took place, okay? Ku Klux Klan arrives, and who arrives? Jesse Jackson comes up, and, and that was the first I'd ever heard of there being a Klan uh, my, my reporters came back saying, hey, do you know we had the Klan back here in Rumford, Maine? And, and I, no. And so I thought that would make a great book, uh, which was put on the back burner because I had a real job for many years. So, you know, 14 years later, I, uh, actually longer than that, hasn't it? Years later, I started write, writing the book. But uh, that it got me going. And my wife, my father-in-law, grew up in Newport. What did they call it in the Klan? One of the great... <laughs> clan kingdoms. <laughs> but he grew up in Newport and he would tell the story when he was a kid seeing a cross burning in Pittsfield next door, right? Pittsfield right next door to Newport. And we say, really, Dad? Because I really, you know, it's the first person, anyone, my history teacher never taught me this stuff. And he said, oh, I'm sure it happened. I was there, you know. And um, so when we started looking at it, there's no books written about this and there's no real Nonfiction books written about this, just a couple of thesis papers that PhD students have written, and, and that's basically what you have to go on. There was very good thesis papers, but there's not a lot of, not a lot of, of history in this in the state of Maine. And so I said, it was, no one's written about it before, so it's a, it was an open door for me to do it. And uh, so that's what we did. Lloyd, my wife back there, are helping me do some of the research, my research assistant. So that's, that's how that came about. Uh, I, uh, the other books over there, one's about the, the uh, Underground Railroad coming through Maine. I have my uh, slave that escaped through Kentucky up through Ohio and then came through Portland, where there's a big history of Underground Railroad places there, and, and uh, escapes through Maine up through my old hometown of Brewa. And uh, that's kind of exciting because the, the foreman of his plantation from where he escaped is after him the whole way. So it's an exciting book, but it also has some real true people in there. Um, in the book that, that were re really were involved in the Grand Railroad, so you might find that interesting. And uh, the first, my first book actually, which took me the longest time, was Midnight Rider for the Morning Star, which is a um, a true story about with a lot of because he did write a lot. Of, he wrote in his journal every day. Uh, Francis Asbury is the first circuit riding preacher in America. Leaves England in 1771, comes to America in 1771, and what's happening in America? The Re American Revolution is about to boil, boil up and take off. And so he's riding his horse five, 6,000 miles a year, preaching the gospel while people are killing each other. So fascinating, fun story <laughs> with a lot of action in it, too. It's told right here in Scarborough, Maine, because he came up, comes up through Maine, tells his story to the, a family in Scarborough, Maine. Um, and so hope uh, any of those books, please come up and take a look at them. We'll ask any questions. Other than that, thank you very, very much. You've been a great, a great crowd. I appreciate that. <laughs>